see heavenly hosts. Uh, they all look to Jesus. He's the perfecter of our faith. Right now, we are walking out this faith journey. And we have to learn how to walk it uh, even unto death, either on the cross or just death on a hospital bed or even at home or sometimes, you know, which, whichever way the Lord wants to find us. All right, so we're going to look unto Jesus. So we've come to four or five stanzas in Isaiah 7, Song number 4. And now we're given a picture of a lamb led to the slaughter. It means sure, certain death, right? A lamb. A lamb is a very young sheep, maybe up to a year old. So what can a year old lamb do? Sometimes they don't even know that they're being led to the slaughter, right? And a sheep, silent before its shear is not that's different. A sheep who has grown a few years, they've grown a full coat of wool, and they're being sheared, right? Um, they may be so dressed up, and when you take everything on, they're just as, as naked as naked can be. Um, so, and it's maximum exposure. Not a very pleasant experience at all. We will learn today six, the six trials of Jesus as he is led as a lamb to the slaughter and a sheep silent before shearers. And we will learn the main theological purpose. Now, these things must excite you. We must always be excited by some theological truth. This is what is missing in the church. This is what has been talked down by too many science and wonders uh, uh, teachers who favor spiritual experiences over above the foundations of discipleship with Christ. That is wrong <clears throat> because we know that Jesus rejected the signs and wonders ministers who come to him on the day of reckoning. There's Matthew 7 and he said, I don't know you. But they said, in your name, we have done a lot of prophecies. We have done a lot of prophetic teaching. We have done deliverance ministries and we have done miraculous ministries. Jesus says, I don't know because you are workers of anomia. Anomia. You are workers who do not work according to the law of God. You don't, you don't have a real uh, foundational theological grasp and it does not grasp you. You can look for signs and wonders everywhere in larger society from the other faiths outside of Christianity, even from non-believers, uh, atheists, some of them can do great miracles. But they don't have the word of God. And this is the foundation of, we, of our spiritual identity. <clears throat> so because of the zealous charismatic reunion teaching on deliverance and decreeing, uh, more Christians are excited about deliverance ministry. Now, I, I, I believe in that even way back 40 over years, Vivian uh, and I, we in our fundamentalist churches, we have witnessed and we ourselves have cast out demons and they were growling and screaming and scolding us. We cast them out. But more importantly then is once they are delivered, they go on to really be part of the working family of God that you and I must be, right? If we are not working family of God, serving one another, we are not serving God. We are not helping the poor. We are not being the light of the world. So that's much more important. So be careful. Uh, this tendency is very strong and many prophetic teachers encourage uh, uh, spiritual experiences over and above. Well, they will say, yeah, you still go back to the word. But practically, most who are following the larger charismatic movement is going for spectacular displays of the power of God in a supernatural way. Now, we learned in the past few weeks, meditations, the real power is the wisdom of God working powerfully through you and through me, all right? In accordance to his will, in accordance to what he desired, and especially the real power to help people out of their darkness, out of their traps, to help people love God and to glorify God. 
That's the real power. Uh, that is wisdom from God. So, uh, so a question we must ask, is God's spirit in it, in our ministry, in our church, in what we seek to do, in the ministers that we follow, and especially the ones that we hold up? Be careful. Some ministries and ministers have become like cult-like leaders. So they sit in a so, such a high place, some ministers of the gospel, that's hard for them to serve the lowly ones, the forgotten ones, hard for them. So any true minister of God, any minister must be able to uh, help clean the floor, help dress up a wound, or really go and attend to the need of the least likable person in our midst, right? So any minister of God to really uh, fulfill the instruction of the Lord and to really understand greatness needs to be a servant. So any minister of God who is high and mighty, lots it over others, pray for them that God would seriously humble them or else they would lose much of their reward, no matter how great a good. But you who are not recognized, you who work silently at home or in your little uh, work station somewhere, you who faithfully do it, but you are doing it with the heart of a servant. So you're serving the CEO with great joy. You're also serving your uh, uh, the, the ones that you supervise over. And you're serving the janitor. You're serving you know, a stranger who comes in. You uh, truly understand what the kingdom of God really is. But not those ministers, those of us who sit in some high and lofty place and just waiting for the audience to approve of us or to give us praise or for them to to uh, push us higher. So let's pray and observe ourselves and let's pray for especially successful ministers. We go to the three verses of the fourth stanza of Isaiah 53, uh, servant song number four. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested, complained, pondered, meditated, asked, for he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. We went through a lot of the I am. God, who is the savior, I am the lamb, I am. Here it is. He was punished for the transgression of his people. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, there was any deceit in his mouth. Wow, amazing. What a description. All right. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. So we now learn the spirit of obedience that really is pictured more in Jesus, the great I am, than in anyone else. Because he only did and only spoke what he saw the Father did and what he heard the Father speak, we're told in John's Gospel. In other words, he went through the scripture as a young boy all the way, over and over again, and he saw what the Father was doing throughout the history of his people. And he heard all the instructions of God. And of course, beyond that, Jesus also had supernatural visions and taken up into the spiritual realm, also that. But the bulk of what Jesus uh, grew up with was the entire 39 books of the Old Testament. And he came to the place where <clears throat> the first word to the devil who tempted him after the 40 days in the wilderness, where Jesus was hungry and Jesus was asked, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Jesus said, man, which is me, I, the son of man, I, the son of the father, perfectly obedient, does not live except I live by every word that comes out of the mouth of the living God. 
get this into us. We want to have that spirit of obedience so that we can hear and hear everything. You know, children who are good children, they're good children because they listen and they listen attentively. And you know that they're not so good children or they become not so good children when they tune you out, right? When they tune you out. I know that the students are not so good students anymore when they tune me out as a teacher, right? So you know that. But when we are obedient and we are observant, we pay special attention. All right, of course, the picture images here picked up by John, the, uh, the baptizer, right, in John's Gospel, chapter 1. And John, the baptizer, he saw Jesus coming to be baptized. And he pointed out, behold, the Lamb of God. Of course, uh, he would remember this scripture here in Isaiah 53 as well, right? He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and uh, like a sheep before it's sheared silent. So now the sheep that is being sheared is exposed, right? A lamb is, a, is, a lamb is up to a year old, right? Very innocent and, uh, and it can speak, of course. So it, it does have a, have a voice to cry when it's hungry, uh, but when it is uh, suffering pain, uh, it may just groan, right? But it's generally just kind of uh, paralyzed within that place. So a lamb is not like a little baby. They just let you know, the whole world knows a, a lamb, uh, really. So the, the lamb, of course, became, be, has, has become, or uh, had become, even in Jesus' days, a daily sacrifice, morning and evening, along with other sacrifices. So the lamb became the perfect picture of a holy sacrifice given throughout the day, throughout the night, right? In the morning, in the evening, so all throughout. And so here we have a, a Jesus who is the sacrifice that is ongoing and that teaches us. It requires a spirit of obedience, of being leadable or is that such a word of being capable of being led? We are told that Jesus was led by the Spirit of God. And also Jesus was driven by the Spirit of God into the wilderness. And so in like manner, uh, we want to lean into this spirit of uh, obedience. Now, a very important scripture is in Ezekiel 36. And before that, God said that I'm going to give the people of Israel a new heart, right? A heart really that can feel, a heart really that, that would want to listen and obey. And then he goes on to say, I will put my spirit within you when I have brought you back from being exiled into the lands. You see, the mountains in, in Ezekiel 36 were crying in shame. Where are all our children? So the hills of Ju Judah all around Jerusalem, they were all crying. They were all ex exposed and naked. Where are all the children? They're crying out in shame because the children disobeyed and they were being punished by God, sent into exile. But then there comes a time when God will bring them back and then he would create a new heart because for them to really come and live in the place where God is, they need a new heart. For you and I to really be in the communion of God and even in his family, you need a new heart. It wouldn't do. If your heart goes cold, if your heart uh, uh, turns away from obeying or uh, listening to God, you won't be part of this family that listens and that listens to obey, right? So the same for God all the more, but he is going to give them a new heart through a new spirit, not a new spirit of their own, but God's spirit himself. So the spirit of God that was to be given in the new covenant is really given so that they can be careful to obey. They can walk in the statutes of God. This is very important because uh, the, throughout history and especially in our time, there are many people who have a lot of rich spiritual so-called signs and wonders or who are, who are seeking and, and learning how to do these, but they lack obedience. They cannot be told. If, I, if they are the leader, no one can tell them what anything else to do. All right? 
and and many who begin to walk in some measure of supernatural power, they cannot be told by their pastors anymore. They cannot be told. They cannot be taught anymore. Now, this is very serious. So it shows that you you are actually destroying the very foundation, the very reason why you were given the Spirit of God in the first place. All right? So John saw, behold, the Lamb of God, and then he the next day, behold, the Lamb of God, Right again, he said, "The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and the Lamb of God." Take a good look. That's Jesus. That's the I am. I am the Lamb of God, and He is the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain. This is He who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So John, the Baptist, said these words, and John, the beloved apostle, recorded this conversation. And we are told also by Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, First Peter chapter one, um, that you know to those who are elect, to, to those dispersed ones who have now uh, received Jesus, because they have come into Jerusalem and they have received the Holy Spirit, and then some of them went back to those places and brought other Jews uh, to in the diaspora, in the dispersed uh, larger Roman Empire. And they were given instruction by the Apostle Peter because he is the Apostle over all the family of the, the, the house of Judah, right? The house that Jesus reconstituted. And so he says that according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the separation to holiness, the sanctification, of the holiness you are separated to holiness by obeying the word so even in john's uh, first john we know chapter two into chapter three the anointing will teach you and lead you into all truth why because you are purifying yourself by the teaching of the knowledge of truth so that when you stand before him you can be like he is so so john the baptist knew it John the beloved knew the apostle and John, you know, he said it also in first John very clearly. And then here we have Peter saying it in the sanctification of the spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. So he pulls together the theology that we have discussed uh, fairly at depth while we were meditating seven song number four so revisit the earlier messages if you want to have a fuller and fuller grasp uh, of uh, what we are learning you are a son of god you are higher than any of the lords of the land any of the prime ministers and of the kings of the land you are positioned higher and so you need to know more much much more of the word of god than even the most important political leader in the land, right? So remember, it is your duty, your responsibility. It is not an option unless you don't believe that you are a son of God, unless you are willing to allow the foundations of the earth uh, to be moved and to be shaken because you don't have justice. You are not able to function with true justice, right? So has justice no voice? Now, the lamb may have no voice, right? A sheep before a shearers may be silent. You know, the sheep is exposed and some shearers who are high at hand, who so don't care about the sheep, uh, they might cut the sheep. And so some sheep are cut when they are exposed and they are also cut. And then some, uh, so the fate of the sheep after sheared is, Thankfully, many of them allowed to grow their coat again, and they need to have their coat removed uh, after one year or so because when it grows too thick, uh, they will have disease and they will have um, they will have all kinds of issues. So shearing the sheep is not necessarily a bad thing; it's a good thing because it releases the sheep and allows them to grow a new, fresh coat as well, right? So it's just like when we are being exposed. When we are being stripped naked, it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because when we carry too much coat and wool protection and nobody exposes us, we are never exposed, 
then we may have all kinds of uh, disease developing, such as pride or arrogance or all kinds of things, lies and deceit. So, so it's also a picture that is good. And so we learn to endure through the exposure. Now, sometimes it's unfairly. While well, some lamb that have been, or some sheep that have been sheared, that means the wool taken off, uh, will be, will be sent to be killed. Obviously, right? So for their meat, and they'll be exported. So whichever the fate depends on what is that calling of that sheep. Depending on your calling, my my specific calling or vocation. If God wants any one of us to die as a Christian martyr physically, then we do so. But he suddenly allows us and wants us to carry the testimony of a true Christian martyr in the spirit. So we are actually suffering unjustly. But yet we obey. All right, Paul also, of course, has to chip in, right? <laughs> uh, concerning the spirit that leads to obedience and he has it in many of his writings i liked it in romans uh here because he says paul a servant of jesus christ um oh sorry this is uh yeah uh, uh chapter one right let me just check my my, my brain just shot circuited yeah seven romans chapter one uh he set a thought for the gospel and he dec- and Je- he spoke concerning Jesus, the Son of God, who, who, who was declared in power, right? Because he was dead and then powerfully resurrected. And so that was with power. According to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And uh, through whom we, Paul and the other apostles, have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of of his name among the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. So, so the faith response is through obedience and it's by the spirit of holiness that raised Jesus from the dead. And so Paul's point in the book of Romans is when you are obedient according to the law of God for righteousness, you will bring others to righteousness. So there's a power of obedience because you will produce the fruit of righteousness. So that's the reason why I wanted to bring in the book of Romans. And you can see it uh, repeated in in a few scriptures and into, into Romans 15 and Romans 16, the, the obedience of faith. All right. So the obedience of faith, which is in response to the spirit of of holiness, the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the spirit that would be the possession of those who are led or who are led by the law of life and not governed by the law of uh, death, right? And just doing the works. So these ones will have that same spirit that brings to obedience so that all things work together for good to those who are the called in Christ Jesus, right? Uh, who are called according to the image of Jesus Christ. So has justice no voice? Oh yes, justice has a voice that can only be heard through the spirit of obedience. We move to the next scripture in seven song number four, stanza four. It is by oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation pondered, protested, thought about it? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was punished. So uh, in this scripture, uh, we are going to encounter the six trials of Jesus on the night He was led away like a lamb to the slaughter, like a sheep about to be sheared, right? But the silence of Jesus is not that he did not say something, but he did not say the things that would prove or that would get him out of that situation. Jesus did not want to get out of that situation. 
All right? Even though he could, 12 legions of angels were waiting for his word to go and take down all those who came to lead him like a lamb to the slaughter. So he was silent in that sense that he allowed the whole process. So we, we see two sets of trials. One is from the ecclesiastical, the Jewish court, the Jewish religious court. Ecclesiastical refers to what belongs to the church. Remember, the Jewish synagogue is also a church. All right, the church in the wilderness. So in the Old Testament, in the Greek, uh, the word ecclesia is so used of the congregation in the wilderness uh, of Israel. So, so that the word, the 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 Greek word ecclesia is, is does not ex exclusively belong only to the Christian church. So ecclesiastical means belonging to the assembly of those who are gathered uh, as a religious body. So three Jewish ecclesiastical trials and then three civic uh, Roman trials. All right, the first three ecclesiastical trials. We see in John 18 by Annas, the ex-high priest. Now, this guy already retired. His son-in-law, Caiaphas, I think, uh, he is the ruling one. And you know what? Some people just can't retire, right? <laughs> Uh, so they have to get get into the so so the high priest questioned Jesus. Maybe he was the main. He probably was the, the main motivator, right? Because he's the most senior guy, professor emeritus, you know, and so forth. So the main guy, and then there are some the existing high priest Caiaphas, and maybe some others, uh, you know, uh, whatever priests of high standing. But he called the shot, and so, of course, Jesus was led to him. And, of course, uh, he was asked about his teaching, and Jesus said, I spoke openly in the world. I've taught openly in the synagogues and in the temple, and I've said nothing in secret, nothing to hide, you see. He, is, he can be stripped naked. He, he can have the confession taken out of him. He has nothing to hide. So we can learn that spirit of obedience in suffering, abuse, and injustice by speaking always the truth and boldly the truth. And so Jesus said, you can ask those who hurt me. Then, of course, Jesus was struck by someone. And then he says, is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? So, uh, Annas just couldn't have a way with him. And so, he's, he sent him bound to Caiaphas, the actual high priest, ruling. So, the chief priests, and they were gathered as a council, the Sanhedrin, as well. Right? This is the Sanhedrin, which we, we also, we know that this is the Sanhedrin as well. But I'm here, I'm featuring Caiaphas. This man performed miracles. If we let him go like this, um, you know, that's in John 11. So, sorry, okay. When he sent him to the high priest, we have to jump to here. But the reason why I, I featured Caiaphas here, and Caiaphas, of course, will be sh shown here. His name is not named here, but Caiaphas is named here. It's because even before that night, right, even before that night, at the time of the uh, resurrection of Lazarus, we are told in John 11, Caiaphas, the ruling priest, all right, they were spying on Jesus, and the report came that many people were turning to Jesus. And so they were discussing this and discussing that, and then Caiaphas, the ruling uh, uh, priest, said, you know, um, you guys don't know what you guys are doing, right? He says, you guys know nothing at all, all right? Because they're debating if it goes like this, everyone will believe in him and Rome will come and take away both our place and our nation. Guess who is patterning their thought and their hand after the beast that comes out of the sea in Revelation 13? Guess who is the beast on the land who thought the thoughts of the beast that comes out from the sea and does the work of the beast that came out from the sea and who is a picture of the beast? Well, it's here. 
the beast leadership, right, of Israel, and specifically here we see the religious leadership. So they are the ones who have the mark on their hands of Rome and mark of the, on their head, right? The mark of Rome. Of the power that ruled and that dis was destroying and oppressing God's people, just like the previous powers in the three beasts before that pictured in Daniel chapter 7. So Caiaphas stood up and said, you guys know nothing at all. Um, and you don't understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And of course, we know from the commentary of the Apostle John that Caiaphas did not say that out of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that he would be, die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but for also together into one, the children of God who are scattered abroad. So in other words, not just those within uh, the land still under the Jewish sub-kings, but also the people of Israel scattered abroad. So from that day, they made plans to put him to death. So he was already put on trial. And then the third time here in the religious court he was before the Sanhedrin on the night he was betrayed and Peter had followed him at a distance and he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire now Peter became the new true priest high priest in a sense right uh, uh, after Jesus so Peter had to follow Peter had to cut off the ear of Malchus and uh, a servant of the the ruling priesthood, and then Jesus had to put it back, uh, and Peter had to lift, according to his name, Simon, which means to listen or hearing. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Simon, Jonah. So, Pe so, so Peter himself had to go through the trial of really uh, enduring suffering because of the love of Jesus. And so the whole council was seeking testimony against Jesus, put him to death. So it was by oppression and by judgment. So our question is, which side of justice am I standing with? Right? Am I standing with the religious court that lay the charge of blasphemy against an innocent lamb? and the sheep who was not afraid to be sheared, to be exposed. So be very careful. In today's world, very sadly, many Christians cannot see between which side of justice. Many Christians cannot. It's a shocking thing, but that's the truth. So the more that we are soaked into a true testimony in the life of Jesus, the better we can see and we can hear. And so I find that many Christians, even ministers, cannot differentiate between uh, making a true testimony and making speculations, right? So, um, so making a true testimony and making a true, uh, 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 just making speculations are two different things. So, so bear in mind, Okay. In fact, I had to counsel uh, someone recently because they were their, their performance at work was twice as good, but their immediate manager marked him down by 50%. And then he brought attention to, to his immediate manager and also the general manager. And the general manager directed the immediate manager to correct the report. Right? And... The manager said, yeah, yeah, he did that. He corrected some wrong places, but he did not correct the part that, that shows that my friend uh, did twice as much, right? He failed to do that. So my friend was telling me, this Christian friend was telling me, you know, uh, this guy hates me and he's just deliberately mucking me down. Well, I said, maybe that is true, that he did deliberately muck you down by half of your performance. But that's speculation. 
right? Because you are judging his heart. But what is true, you can say, is that this manager is a callous manager because not only did you tell him, even the general manager ordered him to correct and he did not carefully correct every part of the report. He left the most important part uncorrected. So you can say a true testimony that he's a callous manager, right? But you can't say that he is deliberately mucking you down and he's hating you. So please understand how to differentiate. So even though it may turn out to be true that this manager hates my friend, but by your speculating, you are already giving a false testimony in the eyes of God. So remember, do not jump ahead even though it, it, it seems to be, do not speculate. You can say it seems that he may have some issues with me, but don't make it as though it's true because that is giving a false testimony. All right, let's go to the third scripture. Oh, sorry, for the, sorry, not the third scripture, yes. <laughs> Jumping ahead. Now for this foundations, Jesus, social religious foundations was taken from underneath him right and so uh, here we can reflect back to last week's teaching on the three foundations right so the first one has to do with the foundations of society and uh, just general societies right so uh, so the, the foundations of Jesus was shaken so that like David Right, when the when he had when he when when the, the word was put out for his death, those who could protect him could not really protect him very much. So except for the few fellows who ran with him from place to place. So what is the remedy when your foundation is shaken? So in I am I take refuge. So we think of Jesus right here. We think of his courage. So when your foundation is taken that social justice, religious justice is taken from you, what do you do? You go to I am. You don't run to your little mountains, right? So the righteous one, you run to Jesus. You don't run into false testimony. You don't run into backbiting. You don't run into just, just uh, you know, all kinds of abusive language or action. You run to Jesus. All right, let's look at the next three civic trials in the second scripture here. Now, it's the three Roman civic trials, all right? So it's, uh, it, it, now it brings the greater republic into play here. Rome was the biggest empire at that time, possibly in the world, right? I know China is, uh, uh, has already quite an empire, and, but uh, really Rome was the one that is... Uh, on top of every other civilization at that time in terms of its its reach and its influence into every part of its kingdom, right? Every part of it with a system of law uh, that is far more comprehensive than anyone else, right? And also infrastructure, roads leading from east to west and uh, cities, Everywhere where the room comes in, the city gets built up spectacularly. So, and they have all kinds of things like water supply systems, latrine systems, uh, etc. Uh, all kinds of things. All right. So, uh, here we have Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, John 18. They led uh, after Caiaphas, right? After visiting Caiaphas. Previously, you see that. After visiting Caiaphas. He now come to the governor's headquarters. And of course, the Jews didn't want to enter the quarters because uh, it was about to go into Passover and that is a very Gentile place. So they need to just keep themselves un, what do you call, uh, untouched by the uncleanness uh, or things that may be unclean right there. There may be blood, there may be other things, right? Uh, inside the court, in the courtyard. So Pilate went outside and asked, what's the man accused of? And then people said, well, if he didn't do evil, why would we have delivered him to you? Now, here again, right, the crowd, 
and the people who get them is speculating that Jesus was doing evil. They are making a false testimony. They are making a false accusation. Now, be very careful not to make false accusation. Be very careful. All right. It's, so it goes even beyond just speculation. Right? A false speculation is very bad. Now, a false accusation is even worse. And they were so confident. If this man were not evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. And Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. You see, Pilate was also made to speak prophetically. So God would use the mouth of a donkey to speak. God would use even someone outside the family of God to speak common sense. And this is even lacking in today's church. A lot of common sense is washed down the drain of political correctness, the drain of uh, popular, populist thinking. All right. And there are a lot of people outside the family of God who still have their common sense. Here, Pilate still had his common sense. But of course, the people's said, well, it's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. So they're spoken truly. We are not allowed to put anyone to death. We are not allowed to persecute anyone to death, physically or spiritually. We are not allowed. And Jesus made it sure. The one who has not sinned, you take the first stone to stone this woman to death. So be very careful about participating in any action of putting someone to death. So all accusations and even false speculations so that people will have a wrong opinion, these are that thing, that we are acting unlawfully. Now, the second of the three Roman trials would be, uh, uh, or civic, you can see civic Roman trials because Herod Antiphas works with Rome Right? He works with Rome as a sub-king. So can you imagine this king of the land has to kowtow to even the governor, Pontius Pilate. All right? So Pontius Pilate, these Roman governors generally look down even on the kings of the land. Right? And you can understand this sentiment uh, because they are much more politically powerful and economically more powerful. So the politically and e economically powerful, they look down on those under them. Even if you are the president of the United States, we can look down on you and we can curse you, we can say all kinds of evil against you because we are more powerful and we can get away with anything, right? So this is what is happening before our eyes. Uh, even when the president of the United States was saying something that turned out to be true and true and true and true. He was told that he was a lawyer and he was a liar, a liar and liar and liar. And finally, when they, when everything is clear that he was speaking the truth, uh, they just don't make apologies. Right? So, but anyway, the, the point is this. You know, um, whoever calls the shot have the power generally uh, want to put others on trial. And so, and so here it is Herod Antipas. It's not just a religious authority, not the high priest, the chief priest, but it is Herod Antipas himself, the son of Herod the, the Great. Um, and um, is it the son of the grandson now? It's the son, yeah. And so he was very glad to see Jesus because he had long heard about Jesus, he was curious about Jesus, curious to see some sign and wonder, right? But Jesus made no answer. So in this case, he was really quiet. <laughs> he was the, the sheep led before this wolf that Jesus calls in, uh, in Luke 13, this fox, sorry, Jesus calls him the fox, right? And then he just kept quiet. He will not answer him. And then finally back to Pontius Pilate, right here. Uh, he was sent back to Pontius uh, Pilate by Herod Antipas, all right? And so Herod with the soldiers treated him content, 
and then he sent him back to Pilate and Herod and Pilate became friends with each other so the people of power are friends of each other but you know what friends of convenience of a same purpose and generally is evil purpose all right so when you are friends only with people who can serve you some good give you some benefit you belong to this category of friends in the New Testament and through the lips of Jesus he uses two words for friends hetairos and phylos and they are all both translated as friends but in every case of the use of hetairos it is a friend like Judas what kind of friend are you to betray me with a kiss or this friend who is just uh, complaining you know about his wage not higher than the one who worked longer hours or the, the friend who who didn't dress properly in wedding clothes all right the hat tyros they're just in for the food in for the party many christians if you are a christian who is just in just to for the party in heaven just in for what is good then you are not really a friend of jesus but if you are a friend who willing to suffer with him and suffer with those who suffer and you are a friend with another person even if they are not friendly with you but you carry that friend a friend loves in all times through all situations a friend is a brother born in adversity born for times of adversity for times of difficulty proverbs 17 17 so make sure that you are a friend jesus has very few friends in the church throughout the history of time even today he has very few real friends but be a friend and you learn to suffer and identify yourself and work with people who are the poor who are the oppressed who are the disprivileged who are the disgraced and don't cut off people even though they may not uh what you call be the very best don't cut them off when they want to reach you connect with them don't cut them off when you cut off anyone you're not a friend right you only disfellowship with believers who refuse to repent that's the only rule just like god would disfellowship himself with his people who refuse to repent so who in our generation right now as we look at jesus one more time as we look at the suffering of the poor suffering of the those who have been unjustly acted against and wronged as we look into our society and around us as we look into doctors who have been delicensed who promoted some cure for covid-19 through hydroxychloroquine or through ivermectin as we look into some of these doctors who lost their jobs or some i know some were killed in in the past for bringing out cures for cancer and other things right so so have we thought about these things have we considered these ones who dare to stand out to be counted and then they are crucified like jesus have we thought about this or oh, we don't care well we must care and because the the lamb led to the slaughter the sheep silent before the shears is still before us today but even when the biggest foundations of justice are being rocked what do we do right remember that we are sons of god so that was the second foundation the heavenly court in heaven still calls for justice even though the earthly court is not bringing justice the heavenly court still requires justice out of the sons of god the sons of the most high who are the gods so you we you and i we are sons of god so even though we cannot effect justice in every part of the world right now there's there's a lot of injustice around the whole world this oppression this the cancel cancer culture anyone who dares to speak something different from the main power that be the ones who control the media the finances 
the, the deep, deep state. Yes, there really is. Anyone who dares to speak the truth, even their own testimony of the truth, they are being acted against. Some are being killed. Even today, even recently, but many are being silenced. Tens of thousands across the world are being silenced. But who have thought about these things? And where is our remedy? Our remedy is to know that even though the ones, maybe we ourselves have been silenced, or maybe you have been silenced, or people you know have been silenced, even though we cannot enact the justice on this earth and the foundations of the earth are still shaken because of that, we can stand with God in this assembly, with God, and, and we, can, we, can, we can be separated by God and to be guiltless of these six things that God named, right? So, so we can really still also, what can we do? Defend the unjust. We can don't show partiality, all right? In other words, we don't favor the rich and the famous. We go on the side of those who are defenseless, right? And the fatherless, and we uphold the cause of the, the oppressed. So sometimes we retweet something that is important. And yes, when you retweet something that is important, you get scolded. I get that all the time because they disagree with them. Right? Doesn't matter. It is for their good to know certain thing. You're help helping to do. So we don't walk in darkness. And we want to help deliver people from ignorance, from lies, and from the wicked plots. All right, we go to the final scripture of the servant song, stanza number four, stanza uh, four. And here we look at the spirit of obedience unto death. And we ask the question, is there really justice for me? So he, the servant of I am, was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the wealthy in his death. Now note here, the plural here, the wicked people is the plural. And with the wealthy one, the wealthy person, and if you examine the other passages in the Old Testament, the wicked and the just, if they both use the singular, you know that it would refer to a collective group of people. If they are both singular, all right, then, then you can say the wicked and the wealthy, even though it's singular here. And if, uh, if it's singular here, then you can say it refers to all people. So this point helps us to understand uh, the criminals who were, many of them were crucified according to the law of Rome, that hill, why is it called the hill of the skulls? Because I guess that's associated with death and death by crucifixion. And so criminals were all killed there, including two ones about to be killed with Jesus. And so that fulfilled that scripture, right? The one to the right, to the left. But then he was buried with the wealthy person in his death. Well, here we see Joseph of Arimathea. This was Joseph of Arimathea, who is a rich, rich man, but who is a, a disciple of Jesus. And this is his own tomb that he allows Jesus to share that tomb. So later on, uh, who's to stop Joseph of Arimathea, right, and his family to put that same, you know, uh, what do you call pot of bones, right? The ossuary, right? After they are dried up, the cups to put it into the same place of Jesus. Who is to stop that? That's his tomb. So you can say that um, he was fulfilling that, right? So what a beautiful fulfillment here in Jesus. And so is that justice for me? Yes. Even if you are the subject of justice and the people who were, the, were sub, the subject of injustice and you yourself subject of injustice, there is glory even in your death. There's, there's glory even when you have to un, 
endure great pain and and shame and humiliation, there is great glory. But you learn to obey unto death. Right? So, so it is something so powerful. The spirit that God baptizes us with when we come into Jesus. The spirit that he gives to us as his word continues to grow into us is to lead us to obedient, un, obedience unto even the day that we die, tragically or perhaps peacefully. It doesn't matter. We are all going to go the way of all flesh. Unless we are an Enoch or we are an Elijah or a few others, but they carry that spirit of true dying. And that's why Paul tells the Corinthian believers that look, you know, we, sh we carry the dying of the Lord Jesus on ourselves daily. So an understanding of the spirit of obedience unto death is what we really want because what we want is to come to Zion, to come with the 144,000 pictured there, right? Who had the name of the Father on their foreheads. So these are the, the little ones following the Lamb who stood on Mount Zion. He is the Lamb led to the slaughter on Mount Zion. And how do you follow him? And such that such a glorification of your ascending Zion is shown here. I heard a voice in heaven like the roar of many waters, the sound of loud thunder. So you carry the name of Jesus and the Father on your forehead, which is Yahweh salvation. Yahweh by the Spirit of holiness unto the Lord. The sound of heads is like sounds of harpists playing on harps, and they will sing a new song before the throne of the living God. And no one can learn the song except the 144,000 who have been redeemed from the earth. It is those who have not defiled themselves with women. Now, this is used symbolically, for they are virgins. Okay, we, are, we know that it's used symbolically because the very first verse of the book of Revelation tells us that God was sending the angel to tell the message through symbols, right? So using the word semiotics, semiosis, semion. So using signs and symbols. And uh, they are those who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits of God and the Lamb. And in their mouth, okay, how can you tell them apart? In their mouth there's no lie, so they don't make the false testimony. And they are blameless, they have no fault. Right? They have no fault. They have done no violence, nor has any deceit in their mouth. Can you see this? Very powerful association right here, Revelation 14, of those who ascend to Mount Zion as true disciples of Jesus who really will have justice eternally. The justice of God to stand gloriously forever, carrying the same spirit of the Lord Jesus. And of course, last week we covered the third psalm, the third foundation points us exactly to this. Right? that his foundation on the holy mountain and God has many children of Jacob and they live all over greater the greater empire of Babylon or Assyria at that time and at the time of Jesus and Paul they lived in greater Roman empire but God loves the gates of Zion more than all other places so of Zion it will be said this one and that one was born in where in Zion and the Most High Himself will establish her. I'll write in the register of the peoples. This one was born in Zion because why? So, so this beautiful psalm, read it over and over again. Soak yourselves and then go to uh, Revelation 14. And then you'll see why it is 
meant for you and for me. It's meant for the, the widow who was about to die and giving up her last two coins. It is for the prostitute all her life. She has come to that moment where her life savings goes into a, a jar that was to be broken, whose perfume is to come up and just bathe Jesus and the whole room of hypocrites, most of them, right? It's written for her. It's written for Zacchaeus, a very wealthy man, but who was so moved that Jesus would come and stay in his home. He's a tax collector, the worst of sinners, right? That's tax collector in the minds of the larger religious communities is the worst of sinners because they get rich at the expense of others. And guess what? He gave half his wealth to the poor and he pays back four times anyone who thinks they have been defrauded by him. Would he argue? No. Anyone who comes to him, I'm sure Zacchaeus would say, okay, here, four times. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. That kind of generosity. So these are the ones who are our model today. May the Lord teach us to lean into the spirit of bonus. Lord, may you help us to, uh, to come back and center it upon your new covenant that, that you long for many, many years, and it was established in Jesus. A new covenant where you give your people a new heart so that your spirit is in them to lead them to obey all your statutes and to keep all your commandments. Lord, today we repent on behalf of the Christian church. Although you have given to us also by your spirit, spiritual gifts and powers for signs and wonders, but Lord, you have given the spirit to your people as you stated it so that they can walk. Finally, they can really walk by the, the wisdom of God, by the discipleship of Jesus, that they can obey joyfully, even enduring suffering unto death. So we pray, especially for the part of the church that's always seeking signs and wonders, deliverance ministries, and so forth, and that forget that we walk as sign and wonder ourselves when we walk in the spirit of learning hardship, learning obedience through hardship like your Lord Jesus, learning obedience through hardship by the spirit of obedience. So help us to feed on feed and grow the spirit of obedience in us. Even today, as we looked at you one more time, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world and our own sin. Thank you, Father. Bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance before you as you follow the lamb led to the slaughter, the sheep led before the shearers and was silent. Unto death, where even when no fault is found in you and no deceit came out of your mouth. For the glory of God, now and always. Amen. <laughs>